All right, here we go. All right, so I have uh, been invited to talk to you all about getting pregnant women vaccinated. And I call this keeping the wolf outside the door. This is all of us, and these are the vaccine-preventable diseases that we're trying to keep away from pregnant women and children. So back in 1972, when WIC first started, you could just concentrate on the nutrition of pregnant women and children, right? That's what you think your job is. That is what your job is. And meanwhile, vaccines were doing their job of keeping vaccine-preventable diseases away. Now, some people were like, wait, wait. First, let's just talk about what are vaccine-preventable diseases. We don't really see these a lot anymore because vaccines have been so successful. So we're just going to talk about just a few of them. This is measles. Okay, some of you may remember one person showed up at Disneyland about a year and a half ago with measles and 132 people that we know of came down with it. It might have been even more. One in 500 people who get measles will die. And measles is so contagious that if I had measles right now and I coughed and I left the room, eight hours later, the measles virus could still infect someone from the table if they touch the table. And then there's polio. This uh, can cause skeletal deformities. You may s meet people who contracted polio back as a child. And then the diseases we're really concerned about today are whooping cough or pertussis and influenza, both which can be really devastating to pregnant women and children. This is a baby um, from Seattle who about, I believe it was two years ago, completely healthy, full term, completely uncomplicated pregnancy came down with whooping cough. All right, so why are we talking today about vaccines to you all? And here's the problem. There is a defensive wall around our community, and that wall has a breach in it. And what's that breach? That breach is something called declining herd immunity. So just stick with me. Some of you may know all about herd immunity. This is just 30 seconds of a very important public health topic, which is, Back in the day when there were no vaccines, if you had all these blue people living in a community, nobody's vaccinated because there were no vaccines. If you get two sick people who come into the community and they cough, and that disease is spread by coughing, well, you know, they cough on one person, the next, the next, the next thing you know, everyone in the community is sick. If you have some people in the population who get vaccinated, and those are the yellow people, well, if red people come in, there aren't enough yellow people immunized to prevent disease, and so still a lot of people are going to get sick. But when you have over 90% of a community, and yes, it takes that many people to be immunized, okay, so the yellow are all immunized, and then the blue are people who either haven't been vaccinated yet, they're newborns, that they haven't had time to get their vaccines, or some people are elderly, they're on cancer chemotherapy, they are protected because even if these sick people come in and they cough on the community, on people, these people are protected by all the immunized people around them. And what's been happening is fewer people are getting immunized, and we're going to talk about that. I don't know if you can see, can someone read the date on when this happened? July 17th, 2018, okay? So we are already, it's July. And we're seeing pertussis rearing its head. And this is why public health people are having nightmares and up all night. Whooping cough or pertussis, it comes in waves. It comes every three to five years. So we had a huge wave of whooping cough in California. This was 2014. I'm sorry, this was 2010. Another wave, 2014. So if you know it comes every three to five years, what's coming, right? And we also know we've got flu. Last year was a horrible flu season. There were pediatric deaths. There was a death of a pregnant woman in Tennessee. So these diseases are definitely out there. Okay, well, why aren't people getting immunized? What happened, okay? Well, I call it the perfect storm. A bunch of factors all came together, okay? The first one is simply Vaccines have been so successful, we don't see these diseases much anymore. When I was growing up, measles was out there. 
but we don't see it so much anymore because most people have been immunized. This is a graph of measles in the United States. This was 1954. I was born 1958. Okay, so lots of cases of measles. Here's where the vaccine was introduced. Plummet, no measles. So people think, I don't need to get m my child immunized against measles, it doesn't exist. But again, if enough people stop getting immunized and we lose herd immunity, <coughs> measles does come back. All right, then there is this infamous study which I promise you, your participants or clients are going to talk about, about do vaccines cause autism? And it all comes from one study done in England that involved 12 patients only by a doctor named Wakefield, okay? And he published an article saying maybe these kids got autism from a vaccine. It turned out he had completely fabricated his data. He actually was hired by lawyers to fabricate the data. He lost his medical license. But it's still, it's this urban myth that just lives on and on. Now, here's the thing about science. If it's real, it's reproducible. If gravity, if I drop a ball, right, and it's going to fall to the ground, it's going to fall whether it's a big ball, a small ball, whether I drop the ball in San Diego or New York. It's replicatable. So this dude, Wakefield, who did this study with 12 uh, uh, 12 uh, kids in his study has never been replicated. This again tells you that's, that's not science. And then we have the growing use of the internet. Okay? On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. People can post anything they want on the internet and you are definitely going to have participants who talk to you and say, well, I read on the internet. And what you want to say is, okay, Let's look at the website. Was that a website that we can trust? How do we know who's writing whatever you read? And then there's, you know, the famous people who go on TV and they talk about how dangerous vaccines are. And again, are they science people? Are they medical people? Some of you may recognize her. This is Jenny McCarthy. She went on Oprah Winfrey and she insisted that it was a vaccine that caused her child to have autism. And that vaccine was given at 15 months. However, in some later interview, someone said to her, when did your child first smile? Well, I don't know how many of you here have kids, but maybe you remember your child usually first smiled two to three months, definitely by four months. Her child didn't smile till eight months. So her child, there was something wrong from the beginning, but she didn't recognize it till, excuse me, till 15 months, which is often when people really start noticing that verbal skills are really falling behind or not present. All right, so one of my favorite writers, Mark Twain, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. And this is just stuff I just pulled from the internet. All right, so what we're here to do today is to tell you it's time to put on your shoes, and we have to go fight against these lies. All right, so... Oh, I think I know. Do you know any of these people? They look familiar. Yeah, they look great. So here's the thing, right? When we're raising our kids, it's not enough to have parents. You need schools. You need religious institutions. You need the little league coach. My, I mean, my son is amazing because of Boy Scouts. You need everyone around a person to help them. And similarly for a patient, you guys are as vital and crucial to the well-being of moms and babies as everybody else in this circle. So we have to be sort of one message and working together. And just to bring this home, they did a study and they looked at parents who initially did not want to vaccinate and then decided, you know what, I think we will vaccinate. So sure, information from a health provider, you know, 35, close to 40%. But if you look at all these other ones, they add up to over the amount of uh, influence that a doctor has. Thought more about it. Why did they think more about it? Because maybe they went to a WIC office and somebody mentioned it. Information from another source, discussed with a relative or a spouse. So you have, it's like dropping a stone in water, the ripples, can have so much effect. So let's talk about 
what you can do to promote vaccines. And I also just want to throw out there, nobody is asking you guys to take out the needle and put it in the pregnant woman's arm, okay? But your job is to sort of help reinforce the message so that it happens when the patient does go to the doctor's office, okay? So the message is very simple. Vaccines are safe and they will keep a pregnant woman and her baby healthy, all right? So starting the conversation, I had to make up this first sentence because I assume you guys are talking somewhere, sometimes, somehow about nutrition. And then it's an easy follow-up because nutrition is about health, so are vaccines. I also want to make sure we touch base today regarding the vaccines you need to keep you and your baby healthy. Have you had a chance to talk to your prenatal care provider about it? And the two main ones are Tdap, which protects against pertussis or whooping cough, and flu, okay? Then again, you don't have to be a subject expert. You don't have to be the immunologist in the room. This is the message. Vaccines save lives. Studies have repeatedly shown that they're safe for pregnant women and their babies. And we know that diseases can spread quickly if people in a community aren't vaccinated. All right, 30 seconds about how vaccines work. I promise you, it's quick and simple, okay? So when we get sick, like right now, I fighting a bad cold. The cold comes into my body and my immune system is the part of my body that revs up and creates something called antibodies, which are like little soldiers, which eventually, hopefully, are gonna come and attack this cold and get rid of it for me. So when you get a vaccine, it's a weakened form of the virus or bacteria. It cannot cause disease, but what it does is it tricks your immune system into making antibodies. Those little soldiers, they're always around. So if the real virus comes in, it's ready, the antibodies are ready to destroy the invading bacteria or virus. So think of it, when a pregnant woman gets immunized, she gives her antibodies to the baby through the umbilical cord. So she is giving a gift before the baby's even born. And that baby is gonna have a lot better chance of staying healthy. Okay, so. They've done studies of who does and doesn't get vaccines. Thank goodness, most people, when they get a recommendation for a vaccine, they'll be like, oh, okay, you think I should have it? Okay, I will. They accept whatever vaccines are recommended. There is a small group that is like, it doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what I say. They are never gonna get vaccinated. I don't believe it, I don't care what science says, science is bunk, whatever. So, what we're taught is, you know, you can, say your message, vaccines save lives, but if someone is here, probably not gonna be able to change their mind and don't really waste your time. But there's this group that we call vaccine hesitant. Someone down the street told them a little scary, something they're not sure, and these are the people that you can definitely make an effect on, okay, by providing information to them. And it's interesting because what one person is a little nervous about is different from what another person is nervous about. So this is where you want to say, do you have a particular concern? Let me see if I can help you. And if I can't, you know, that's a great question for you to ask your doctor or your midwife. Okay? All right. Very first question. Are they safe? Are vaccines safe to give to pregnant women? All right. Well, this is what is not safe. Okay, do not get on a ladder that's on a little thing that's here, that's there. okay. That is not safe. Also, if people are around your house in hazmat suits, probably not a good idea to just be sort of hanging out and watching what they're doing, okay? So that also, not safe. All right, vaccines, on the other hand, are safe, all right? Here's the risk of serious uh, things that could happen in the United States. How many here came here today in a car? You probably didn't even think you had one in 17,000 chance of being injured in a car accident. You never think about choking uh, on food like, you know, I shouldn't eat, but there's that risk. There's a risk of drowning in a bathtub. The risk of a serious or life-threatening event happening from a vaccine, less than one in a million, okay? So, yeah. Okay, so the message is both the flu vaccine and whooping cough vaccine are very safe for pregnant women and their babies, and studies have repeatedly shown these vaccines are safe. 
All right, can flu shots cause the flu? This is something that a lot of people ask me in my office. All right, let me explain how the flu virus is made. They take the flu and they kill it. They inactivate it. Heat, chemicals, it is dead. It cannot come back from the dead, <laughs> okay? So here's my analogy to my patients. You take an egg and you throw it in boiling water for long enough and you got your hard-boiled egg. You're asking me, can a chicken come out of that hard-boiled egg? It can't happen. So a flu virus cannot replicate and grow and give someone the flu once it's made into a vaccine. So here's the message. You know, and you're going to explain to your patients, flu vaccines cannot, they do not, cause anyone to come down with the flu. Now, I've definitely had patients who said to me, but, but, I had a flu shot and I got sick. Okay, that's one of two things. One is, somebody coughed on you yesterday at Vons, so you don't get, like, if you got exposed to flu the day before, it's not going to prevent the flu because vaccines take a couple weeks to take effect. And when do people get flu shots? In flu season, when flu is around. So, so that's number one. And number two, there are a lot of illnesses out there. There's not just influenza, there's parainfluenza, there's adenovirus, there's all sorts of viruses. But we are trying to prevent influenza. So it won't keep you from getting sick, it won't keep me from getting this cold, but it will keep women safe um, from influenza or have a, give them a greater chance of being safe. So it's false that flu vaccines can cause the flu. However, it, these are true, that pregnant women who get the flu are much more likely to give birth to children with birth defects. And we also know that if a woman comes down with flu, she's at a far greater risk for miscarriage and preterm labor. And we know study after study has shown that flu vaccines are safe in pregnancy in every trimester. Mm -hmm. All right. every trimester? Every trimester. If I have a patient who comes in and it's flu season and she is five weeks pregnant, I give her the flu shot. Okay. All right, what about vaccines and autism? Well, first off, you already know the Wakefield study was totally bogus, right? But then some people said, okay, well, maybe it wasn't that vaccine that Wakefield was writing about. Maybe it's something else about vaccines that causes autism. Hey, maybe it's mercury in vaccines, which, by the way, we don't use anymore, okay? We used to put mercury, I mean, thimerosal, which was a form of mercury, in these big vials. It was a preservative to keep this clean and not contaminated because we kept putting needles in and drawing it out and immunizing people. Now, every pregnant woman and child in the United States gets single-dose vaccines. We don't need to put a preservative in them because we give it and we throw it out. But just so you understand, chemical compounds can be similar chemically, and they're not the same. And the classic example is methanol and ethanol. They sound alike. Meth methanol is an antifreeze. You're not going to drink antifreeze. Ethanol, some of you may drink on a Saturday night, okay? <laughs> so similarly, methylmercury and ethylmercury, okay? Methylmercury is a type of mercury. We know it's toxic to the neurologic system. Ethylmercury was the preservative. They were completely different. This has never been shown to cause neurologic problems in anyone who received a vaccine containing that preservative. But it's moot. It doesn't exist anymore, okay? The other thing I just want to point out is, I pulled this from uh, Facebook. This was a chiropractor in Australia who said, hmm, as we've been giving more vaccines, autism rates are increasing, so it must be related, okay? Well, here's my favorite author again, Mark Twain. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so, okay? So what, in fact, we know about rising uh, incidence of autism, and I don't want to turn this into an autism talk, though I could speak for hours on that as well, is it used to be we didn't even classify autism. It was sort of related to schizophrenia. And then as we became more aware of it, we became better at diagnosing it. And then we actually included, you know, autism spectrum, 
which includes even simple things like social anxiety. Not simple if your you know, child has it, but I mean, there is a wide range of what is considered on the autism spectrum. And we have much, much better funding. We have resources in school. So there's lots of reasons why it seems like, the n I mean, the numbers are increasing, but it's not because of vaccines. Okay, so here's your message. Autism is a burden for many families. We all want to know what's causing it and how best to help it. But again and again, scientific studies have shown vaccines do not cause autism. All right. So, in addition to reminding patients, make sure you're getting your vaccines. Did you get your vaccines? Have your kids been vaccinated? A strong recommendation includes knowing exactly where a patient or a sorry, participant should go um, to get that vaccine. If they say to you, oh, my doctor said they don't have vaccines at the office. Oh, okay, well, here's where you can go. So I don't know Imperial County. Do you guys know where people can go for vaccines? Health department. Health department? So, so you want to be able to say, oh, okay, here's the address. Here's the hours, maybe have it all on a little sheet so you just give it to them so that they know exactly what they're going to do, where they're going to go. All right. So if your prenatal care provider doesn't have vaccines at their office, you can receive them at, and you're going to give them the place. All right. Finally, walk the walk. All right. And what do I mean by that? I mean, don't do as I say, not as I do. Okay, I can't tell you how many patients say to me, are you vaccinated? Did you vaccinate your kids? I mean, I'm a doctor, but I am number one a mother. I would never do anything to harm my children or the children of my patients or my patients who are children. And they are all fully vaccinated if I have any say so in it. Okay, so here are the... Um, the vaccine preventable diseases that are recommended for healthcare personnel. So definitely influenza, hepatitis B, measles, mumps, rubella. This is the whooping cough vaccine. We, it goes by the abbreviation Tdap and chicken pox or varicella. All right, I have been fully vaccinated and I recommend the same for my WIC participants co-workers, family, and friends. All right, so now we're going to watch a little six-minute video. If it weren't for vaccines, half of you wouldn't be here today. You'd be dead. Vaccines have prevented more deaths than all the rest of modern medicine put together. People think that vaccines work simply. Here's your child. You give him a vaccine. He becomes immune, shown in blue. He's protected from infection, shown in red, and so he doesn't get sick. But that's only part of the story. It also stops him from transmitting the infection to others, the other white dots, and that's critical. I'm going to show you how this happens. I'm also going to show you how you understanding this and you communicating it to others will decide whether vaccines in the future go on saving lives the way they've already saved half of yours. So here's an example, whooping cough. When you get whooping cough, you cough for weeks, even months. Coughing comes in bouts that won't stop. You can't get your breath. You feel like you're coughing up your lungs. If you're a young child, you may end up with permanent lung damage, permanent brain damage, or you may die. This animation shows in each row of white dots a year's worth of newborn babies. As they move across the screen, they're getting older, so that at the right-hand side, they're just going past 25 years old. We're in the 1930s. There's no whooping cough. Most of the dots are blue because people are immune to whooping cough. They've had whooping cough. There are gaps in the rows where previously children have died and disappeared off the screen. Every three years, there's a big epidemic shown by the red wave going through the children on the left. Many of them die. The survivors become immune, shown in blue, and the epidemic dies down. Then, when enough young, non-immune children have been born to sustain one, another epidemic erupts, 
and scythes through the children. Immunity to whooping cough is strong and long-lasting. There's no whooping cough in the teenagers or the adults here. Let's fast forward to the 1950s. Whooping cough vaccine for infants have been introduced, and it's been enthusiastically accepted by parents in, in fear for their children's lives. Immunity to whooping cough becomes near universal by six months of age, but now induced by vaccine, not by infection. The rates of cases and deaths of whooping cough plummets by 100 to 200 times. The disease is gone. The problem appears to have been solved. But it hasn't. Now we're in 1978. Everyone's forgotten about whooping cough. It's not a threat anymore. Someone comes up with a theory, later shown to be false, that whooping cough vaccine has a rare, severe side effect, allegedly causing brain damage in a small number of infants. This is widely publicized. People lose their confidence in the vaccine. Large numbers, more than half, stop using it. And children, white dots, non-immune to whooping cough, start to reappear in the population. Inevitably, like clockwork, the epidemics restart. Many lives are lost before enough vaccine is, vaccination is reintroduced, the confidence of the public returns, and once again, the disease becomes rare. But the reluctance to use the vaccine remains strong in many countries, so new vaccines are developed that have lower rates of the common side effects, swollen arms, high temperatures, and so on. These are introduced in the UK in 2004. But something else interesting and unexpected is happening. Slowly, well, perhaps not so slowly, but we're quite slow to realize, whooping cough starts to come back. Why are we slow to twig? Because it's in the wrong place. It's not where we expect it in the young children. It's in teenagers and young adults. When a teenager gets a cough, no one thinks of whooping cough because it's known as the disease of young children. So why is this? Look at the blue color on the slide. As you go across from left to right, it gets paler. The vaccines are inducing good immunity, but it isn't lasting as long. And the newer vaccines, it's fading even faster. Well, whooping cough. Coughs in young teenagers and young adults. Bit of a nuisance, you might think, but nothing more. You'd be entirely wrong. Who has babies? Young adults, that's who, or if you happen to live in the UK, teenagers. So, when they get whooping cough, they cough on their young babies, and as you all now know, when young children, watch the red arrows, are exposed to whooping cough, they get very ill, and some of them die. And that's exactly what happened in 2012 in this country. A dozen deaths, and many scores of cases of whooping cough in infants after years of hardly any at all. I think you can see from all this that when you give a vaccine to someone, you need to think a bit more broadly than just the person you're giving the vaccine to. Sure, they stand to benefit, but so does everybody else, including people who can't make responses to vaccines, and people who, for whatever reason, choose or can't get their children immunized. What the UK did in response to this recent crisis was immediate. They offered vaccine to pregnant mothers. Here the arrows are blue. The babies are being born immune. Antibodies from the mother crossing the placenta or being swallowed in breast milk give these babies immunity for long enough to last until they are old enough to have been immune, immunized and protected themselves. Around about 60% of mothers are already accepting the vaccine and happily at the moment, immunized, uh, whooping cough rates in infants in the UK seem to be falling. But there's another point to all of this. We don't just pass infections around between each other. We're very good at communicating ideas, us humans. For a vaccine program to work, people need to understand why it's important, not just when the disease is common, but also when it's become rare. This is the biggest challenge for immunization in the 21st century. What we now need to do is to explain to one another how we can help ourselves and each other by using vaccines. Thank you. This is a picture of a tsunami. In 2010, we had 10 infant deaths. Okay? We started immunizing pregnant women, not enough of them, but 
even though there were more cases of whooping cough in California in 2014, we had fewer deaths because some pregnant women were starting to get immunized. So this is the question. When is that next tsunami coming? And how can we keep this box with a zero in it? And so everyone here, me and you and all of us, that's what we're working on. We're trying to be a bulwark. We're trying to protect against the, we, what we know is coming which is another pertussis epidemic, okay? So I want you to think about that when you're like, oh, I got so much other stuff to talk about. How can I talk about vaccines? It's a simple message, you're reinforcing it, and then you're encouraging them to talk to their doctor or midwife or prenatal care provider. So we've been talking a lot about how to keep yourself and your baby healthy. And I just, before you leave, I wanna just make sure that you know about the vaccines that are recommended in pregnancy and that you've talked with your prenatal care provider about them. Yes, I don't like so much the vaccines. Huh, okay. Are, are your kids vaccinated? Um, some yes, I'm some no. Okay. <laughs> so was there a reason that you said yes to some of the vaccines, but no to others, or do you have a particular concern about getting vaccinated while you're pregnant? Well, one of the things is the, the things that are going around in the news, um, that they are not so much effective. I heard that the flu is not like 20 or 30 percent effective, so what's the point if it is not so much effective? That's a great point. So let me ask you this. If they had a vaccine to prevent breast cancer, and it wouldn't prevent every case of breast cancer, but you could decrease your risk of breast cancer by 30%, would you choose it? I might, but there's still, what about the Right, other so there's absolutely, that's right. So you're going from maybe 100% down to 70 or 50%, but it's more protection than if you didn't. And the other thing that's really important to know is the protection lasts in babies for even longer than just the pregnancy. The studies have shown that pregnant women who get vaccinated against the flu, their babies for up to six months after birth are less likely to get the flu and less likely to end up in the hospital. But these are all great questions and I really hope you'll talk to your prenatal care provider about them because we know vaccines save lives and we want you and your baby to be healthy. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. When it would be the best, the, the best time to get vaccinated? Another only three months. Another great <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> so, in in flu season, we want to protect you the minute that flu is out there. So, if it's August or September, and you're three months pregnant, you go and you get your flu shot right now. Whooping cough. We're most concerned about protecting the baby. And we know if you get the vaccine in the third trimester, the last three months of pregnancy, then your baby will have the most number of antibodies and be most protected. So we want you to get the flu vaccine as soon as it's available. The Tdap or whooping cough vaccine is in the third trimester. Okay. You have great questions. I Thank really you. hope you'll ask those to your doctor or midwife. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.